Dr. Sarah Fine. Um, Dr. Sarah Fine is an educator and scholar working at the intersection of practice and research. She currently directs the San Diego Teacher Residency hosted at the High Tech High Graduate School of Education and also teaches courses in educational leadership at the University of California, San Diego and at Harvard Graduate School of Education. Sarah has written for a wide range of publications, including the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, Chalkbeat, Education Week, Utopia, and Educational Leadership, as well as scholarly journals, such as the Journal of Educational Change and the Harvard Educational Review. Her recent book, co-authored with Jal Mehta, is In Search of Deeper Learning, The Quest to Transform the American High School. In 2019, the book won the um, Grow Mayor Award in Education. Welcome, Dr. Fine. Thank you so much for having me. Our pleasure. So, um, uh, Dr. Fine, we have uh, um, a few questions for you um, in the intersection of curriculum and, and teacher education. Um, you are the director of the High Tech High Graduate School of Education in San Diego, and your teaching and scholarship focuses on the intersection of curriculum and teacher education. Um, can you tell us a bit about how it is different or the same uh, uh, to other teacher education programs um, in the United States or perhaps across uh, North America, and what values or theoretical frameworks informed your and your team's work in crafting the program and its curriculum? Sure, yeah, um, that's a big question, but I will try to tackle it. And I, I also should say, I am not the director of the entire graduate school. I just direct the program, the San Diego Teacher Residency. So um, I can speak to my experience designing and, and running that program. Um, I would start by saying that our, our why is quite different than I think a lot of preparation programs in terms of the type of teaching and learning that we are seeking to cultivate um, in our candidates. And so we, as you, as you talked about, my um, the origins of my career began, I was a teacher, and then I got involved in this very long project that produced the book on deeper learning. Um, and that book relied in turn on a lot of frameworks, um, but I would name a couple uh, as particularly important. And the reason I'm naming uh, the frameworks for the book is that I see my work in designing the residency as a direct extension of my my work in American high schools, trying to understand what produces powerful learning for students. Um, so I would say, first of all, um, situated learning theory. So really thinking about what does it mean for learners to deeply engage with the real work of a field, um, not with a kind of contrived, constructed version of that work, um, but really become uh, legitimate peripheral participants in the work and gradually become inducted um, via apprenticeship deeply into the work. I would say that informs both how we think about preparation of teachers in my program and also how we think about what should happen in K-12 classrooms. Um, so obviously we want our novice teachers to feel like they have a real role right off the bat as novice teachers, that they're not just observing, they're not sitting as flies on the wall in the back of the classroom, which is often what programs require of them, but that they have assets to contribute right away as student teachers and that they have a real role to play, which gradually expands as their expertise and their skill set expands. So that's kind of within the program. But also we want them thinking about engaging young people in the real work of the fields that they're, they're um, learning about. So if they are in a mathematics class, we want them helping students see themselves as mathematicians, obviously junior mathematicians. We want them doing the type of thinking and discussion that, that mathematics values, not the kind of approximation of it that often happens in, um, in classrooms. Um, so we really want them helping students engage in the ways of knowing and the ways of thinking that are authentic to the field, um, which in turns requires them knowing what those things are. Um, so for example, our science candidates, we really try to find folks who have experience doing science, not studying science, not reading about science, but actually being in a lab um, in some authentic way so that they understand the ways that science is political, the ways that it's messy, the ways that, you know, uh, the, the five-step scientific process, the ways that high schoolers often learn about it is not actually as cut and dried as it seems in the textbooks. Um, we want our, our teachers knowing the types of questions that, that science pursues and engaging their students in those kinds of pursuits. So um, I would say that piece around situated learning is very important. Um, 
Also, of course, constructivism, we think very hard and constructionism both, um, which I see as kind of living in line with each other. So all the way back to Piaget, thinking about learners, not as empty vessels, but as folks who come in with all kinds of pre-existing schemas with funds of knowledge that they can access with ideas about the world, which may or may not match um, all the ideas about the world that a teacher might want to cultivate, but that we, we engage with what students already know, what they already think, um, and that we're not just dumping content into what we would might assume is an empty slate. Um, and we're really working against the grain on that, even though that theory, you know, I'm sure you know that theory in your faculty work very deeply on this on this front as well, but it's it's so deep in the water to think about teachers as conduits for dumping knowledge and skills into the quote unquote empty minds of their students that when we receive our candidates, no matter how talented they are, it takes a lot of slow, careful work with them to help them begin to see their students as humans who have ideas and concepts already formed in their heads and um, who, you know, we need to be researchers and scholars of our students thinking and so forth. That is not a conventional way of thinking about what a teacher does. So um, I'd say constructivism is, is very important. And then of course, like the social part of that, which Vygotsky added. So thinking about learning as a social process, learning in community, the role of psychological safety, the role of roles and, and groups, learning, seeing students as learning from each other, not just from their teacher. Um, again, that's something we want to help our candidates understand very deeply. And also we, we see it playing out in our program. They learn from each other, not just from us as instructors. And they are learning, um, you know, their learning is mediated by how safe they feel in the groups that they're with. And, and their learning is also influenced by the ways in which they feel they can show up as their full selves to those groups. So all of those pieces I see, I see the way we are designing our program as needing to be very symmetrical to the way that we want our teachers to design and run their classrooms for young people. Um, I think adult learners are not really that different from children, developmentally maybe, but but you know, if you step back a hundred feet, it's really the, the, the underlying principles are the same. Uh, and then finally, project-based learning is the last piece. So we are trying to help our candidates see projects as a promising way to organize learning. So students having a set of essential questions that guide an arc of learning, seeing the destination of that learning as something that is exhibited publicly to a real audience rather than just turned into the teacher um, and engaging with the community as much as possible, serving the community when possible. Um, so project-based learning also is kind of a backbone of our program. That's uh, amazing. Uh, thank you. Um, when you were talking about Piaget, I my my, my ears got um, pricked because you know um, um, because unfortunately Piaget's work was misinterpreted in in its mo uh, mostly right because uh, it was translated into uh, streaming. It was translated into you can't go into a more advanced math class. And I'm giving the example of mathematics because it's close to my, uh, it is my field, my mathematics education. And so unfortunately, Piaget's work was misinterpreted, not that he ever claimed that uh, uh, students need to be streamed, but that's how his work was uh, translated into math, uh, into um, uh, systems of education worldwide, I must say. Um, uh, so I was wondering about uh, this zone of proximal development where I see it as, as also another concept that's misinterpreted in uh, teacher education programs where uh, teachers translate mostly as something, as a theoretical framework that justifies why I need to pair a weaker uh, student with a stronger uh, student and that that's a misinterpretation of mm -hmm. what uh, Piaget uh, meant to uh, do uh, or to convey. I think uh, the idea of the zone of proximal development in the teacher education program is understanding how people learn and they learn from each other. Sometimes you are the teacher, sometimes you are the learner. It's not that there is Absolutely. one person who is deemed to be stronger in math that always takes on the uh, the role of uh, the teacher. So that that's something I wanted to uh, perhaps uh, uh, develop uh, further with you. And um, also another thing that, uh, another comment that um, uh, made me think about uh, what teacher education programs do in terms of curriculum is the metaphors. What, how do we perceive teachers in the teacher education program? You um, mentioned uh, uh, we no longer 
see teachers are as conduits, uh, you know, as as people who who um, a transfer or mobilize knowledge. Mobilize um, knowledge is not something static that to be right. you know to be treated as an object that needs to be mobilized from yes. one place from the te- teacher's dimension to a student's dimension. It is something very dynamic. It is something very organic, and as you said. It is something that has to be done based on what um, students know, but build off of that so that we can uh, think about teacher candidates and their students, future students, as uh, within a, uh, an asset framework, not a deficit Absolutely. framework. It's not that you don't have uh, an understanding of a student, you know, the student doesn't have an understanding of, of um a mathematical concept. It is basically working together to understand um, uh, concepts. And you you use examples from uh, science. And every time you said science, I read or I heard or I echoed mathematics. We uh-huh. that's that's another thing we need to um, work with in, um, teacher candidates to allow them to think of themselves and of their future students as mathematicians. Right. And and yes. and this conception is, needs to be, to happen in the teacher education program. Do you have what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I just agree. Um, I, I would go back first to what you said about um, applying the idea of an asset stance to both young people that teachers work with, but also pre-service teachers. I think um I think it's fairly uh, common now, at least in California, it's even written into um, the assessments for novice teachers in California, that we need to be taking an asset stance with young people. We need to think about what funds of knowledge, cultural, linguistic, um, and so forth, do they walk into the class with? What do they already know well? What are they passionate about? What do they care about? What languages do they speak? And so forth. Um, And build from there, uh, rather than looking at them as walking, talking, empty vessels to be filled or walking, talking deficits, like they can't do this, they can't do that. Um, I think it's less common to think about teacher candidates that way. I think often when, uh, and we've noticed this, when teacher candidates arrive at a a program that's supposed to to help them be ready to teach, we think about all the deficits they, they have. What can they not yet do? They don't yet know anything about pedagogy formally. They don't yet know how to manage their classrooms effectively yet. You know, they don't yet, don't yet, don't yet. And we see even our mentors who are lovely, our mentor teachers who work with our novices, it's very easy to fall into that trap where they see all of the things that the student teachers can't yet do. um, And they take it upon themselves to fill that bucket up with a bunch of stuff. Um, And it's true, there are things they don't yet know how to do. That's why they're in a program. um, And hopefully we can equip them with skills that they did not have when they entered. But also they enter with funds of knowledge as well. Right, they have passions and interests and languages and cultures and backgrounds, um, especially as we work to recruit more teachers of color. A lot of them have cultural funds of knowledge that match those of their students better than our predominantly white teaching force. And so we've really, in our program quite recently, been, been taking seriously the idea of what does it look like to start with what our candidates already know and already bring and, already, and what can they teach each other and how can we start by having them enter their own classrooms and start with where they feel confident and comfortable rather than feel like, oh my God, that amazing mentor of mine has all these skills. I have no idea where to even start. Oh, but I know something about this thing. I know something about the music my kids listen to because I listen to it too. Let's start there. Or um, So that's not mathematics. I'm a humanities, my background's in humanities, but I, I certainly think that um, some of my skillful math instructors who are working with my candidates think about mathematically what kind of thinking do they already carry maybe they're not maybe they're not our teacher candidates actually don't have the deep content knowledge we need from them but they have something they chose to be a math teacher for a reason so let's start there and let's build from there and let's honor different ways of approaching problems and let's engage in rich mathematical discussions together as adults the same way we want our young people to do and so forth so i, I think that um piece around zone of proximal development, I would agree. We we really push on, um, we use Zaretta Hammond's work quite intensely. Um, and she talks about productive struggle, which in my mind is a, a useful way to think about the ZPD, right? When, what is the distinction between doing a task that is easy or simple or straightforward 
we're doing a task where the struggle is so high that actually it just leads to frustration. How do we help our adult learners and our students find the place where they are productively struggling with each other towards some sort of learning goal? Um, and how do we set up the circumstances for them to do that? It doesn't feel good. It's not comfortable to struggle, but you know, we, we want all of them in that place. And I, and I think you're right. I think that's a, we have found that to be a richer way to think about zone proximal development than that kind of linear original Vygotsky idea that like, okay, here's the, here's the top and here's the bottom. And like, let's make sure every kid gets sorted out um, against each other. I think that's very individualistic. It doesn't really serve that kind of social learning that you were talking about. Yes, um, I'm, absolutely. Uh, when you said uh, that um, uh, teaching teachers um, is um, forcing them or creating the conditions, and, and this is me paraphrasing what you said, uh, and, and considering the political and messy and non-linear um, nature of learning, um, that that can be that can be occasioned in ma in, in uh, teacher education programs for sure. Um, uh, I have um, another question with regards to um, uh, the your background. Uh, what works of scholarship has in uh, in um, what works a work of scholarship has inspired your thinking about what schools are for? So, um, uh, and I think that's a relevant question because when we think about teacher education programs, I think the, um, the, the, the question that drives our thinking about the designing the curriculum is our understanding of what schools are for. And how does this inform your thinking and interaction with uh, your team members and um, in-service and pre-service um, teachers? Your questions are very meaty. <laughs> I, have, I have trouble knowing where to start. Um, I think I would start that one thinking about what schools are not for. Um, because I think a lot of the purposes that, at least in the U.S. context, schools have served on a broad scale are purposes that we reject uh, in, in my program and in the schools that we work with as well. Um, so Patricia Graham uh, wrote a, a very beautiful short history of um, public schooling in the United States throughout the 20th century. Um, she names uh, and, and kind of traces out the origins of mass public schooling, especially secondary schooling, as with the goal of assimilation. Right, of trying to take a diverse, linguistically, culturally diverse um, public and assimilate them to certain traditional, arguably white values. Um, and at that time, industrialist values also around work, around timeliness, around, um, you know, not asking questions of the structures that frame your life and so forth. Um, I think that a lot of educators are, are well aware that schools have been assimilationist institutions and remain so in, in a lot of ways and that that is not in fact um that that is that taking that deficit lens among other things um that we don't want to do um she also talks about schools as being very focused on individual achievement um and and kind of the the somewhat capitalist project of sorting and ranking children um according to a very narrow set of success indicators um, and deciding who is worthy of higher education and who is not. Um, again, I think a lot of our schools still serve that purpose. Um, I think most of them do. In particular, I think that schools still serve as instruments of social reproduction and, and are basically reproducing a sort of socioeconomic breakdown, who is worthy, who is not, who is going to be sort of pushed into the underclass, the service sector, um, and who is going to go on to higher ed and, and um, earn a living wage and so forth. So I think those are two things we reject, that kind of individualistic, pseudo meritocratic, assimilationist purpose schools. Um, I think where we look to for inspiration are folks like uh, Paolo Freire and some of those who have followed in his wake, so like bell hooks and so forth, who see the possibility for education to be liberatory. Um, not that it is always, um, and arguably state-run schools, there, there's an inherent uh, tension there in actually liberating students. Um, but the idea that education can be a process of becoming more human, of problematizing and seeing the power structures that frame your life and, and either constrain or open possibilities for you, of un understanding yourself in relation to power, um, and ultimately of acting on power structures to change them when they are inequitable. That's the, that's the, 
the goal. It doesn't mean we're doing it. But I think we are trying to raise a generation of educators who actually, number one, see the problems in the ways that school practices are still assimilationist and still focused on individualism. Um, and number two, know what to do instead to create a more collectivist, liberatory set of classrooms where kids feel valued and seen and where different types of knowing are, um, you know, where we hold that up is like, we don't want 30 of you all knowing and being able to do the exact same things. That's not how society works. Um, so let's cultivate and celebrate what everybody is able to um, learn and and let's work together on problems of shared concern and let's um, think about doing something that's greater than the sum of the parts and so forth and let's think about knowing ourselves and looking at the world differently. I think that's what we're going for. I don't think that's it's always where we get to, um, but I think it's a pretty strong stance against sort of some of the more um, conservative practices that still dominate schools in the U.S. I think uh, you touched upon the um, uh, a important idea or, or notion of what schools should be for, and that's democratization of a quality, uh, access to quality um, uh, education, and also um, referring to teachers as change agents. Uh, you, mm -hmm. uh, a few times you said that this may not be um, you know, happening in, in the field, but I think when teacher education programs produce this kind of thinking teachers, you know, that don't go um, uh, through the motions of, of uh, filling out forms or, or lesson plans that are uh, being used over and over for many, many years. Uh, teachers are change agents. And I think uh, a teacher education programs that acknowledge this um, uh, and, and, and remind themselves and, and their teacher candidates that that's the goal, right? We, what schools are for is a very important question to uh, think about. Um, so let's let's go to the next question. How has your personal experience shaped your understanding of curriculum and teacher education programs? I know you talked about uh, your education, but uh, yeah. we should focus some more. Yeah, that's um. So I just did a TED talk, a TEDx talk, uh, recently in Canada. It was it was amazing. I got to spend some time in Manitoba, and I, that this is a story I tried to construct for that talk was about my own. Um, background and in particular my induction into the field of teaching um, when I, I was very young I was 22 straight out of college and because of the moment that I entered the field um, as well as my own personal history um, I think that I, rep I, I unwittingly reproduced a lot of very oppressive practices in my classrooms. I had no formal training. I was considered highly qualified under um, what was the No Child Left Behind in the United States. Got dropped into an urban classroom, predominantly um, students of color, predominantly white, young, mostly female teachers. And we, we took on a very authoritarian, repressive approach to teaching um, that was all about micromanaging both behavior and learning. Um, and also teaching skills to our students that were really out of context. So back to our earlier conversation about the real work of the fields. Um, you know, I was teaching my students skills, which arguably are important. Like I, as an English teacher in high school, we were, you know, identify the main idea of a text and find evidence for an interpretation of, you know, but we weren't doing it in a way that allowed my students to see why and how those skills could be put to use in the context of their lives and their communities. Um, it was really being, um, we were doing it because of what the tasks asked them to do. And because we were at a high poverty school, we were in danger of being shut down if our kids didn't make enough progress on the test. So we were all kind of, um, I don't want to cast myself as a victim. I think I made a lot of choices, but also we were all, our lives were very framed by the political environment we were working in. And I don't think I served my students very well at all. There were some moments I think we kind of edged our way toward more authentic, rich, deeper, liberatory learning, but very rarely. More, more often we were just kind of all going through the motions of trying to pass these gate to, gatekeeper tests and trying to get them to college in these very narrowly conceived ways. Um, and really also just exerting a lot of power over our students, which is something that schools do, especially with adolescents. I think adolescents are often perceived as threatening. They're big, they have a lot of capacity, um, they can do a lot of stuff, and, and schools often respond, especially in the U.S., to students of color by clamping down on, on behavior management and becoming even tighter on control, um, which I think is the wrong approach because what adolescents crave and need is actually um, opportunities to exercise freedom um, and then to learn from 
that exercise. So I did a lot of things very, very wrong. It took me a long time to start to even begin to understand the various things that had gone into those choices. Um, uh, and I, I see my work now very much as like a form of atonement for that. Like I don't want other novice teachers to reproduce those mistakes um, because they have no formal training, because they don't have the supports to learn how to think about the system in certain ways. Um, it shouldn't take 15 years to start to realize, oh my God, I was I was part of the problem. I was not part of the solution. Um, so, and I, and I think in the US also, it's been connected to a kind of racial awakening for white folks in this country around systematic inequality, racial injustice, the way that that is embedded, not just in behaviors, but in institutions, in particular schools. Um, and that I think I think there's a moment here where more folks are ready to do that work and think about things that way, which is serving in our favor. We have a lot of interest in our program. Our students come in not always knowing, but ready to think in certain ways that um, they might not have been if, if they were an older generation. But um, I definitely see my own history as a teacher as part of the work I'm trying to do now. That's very much appreciated. Um, thank you so much for sharing this. I think that making it so personal and, and, and understanding from one's mistakes, I think that really speaks to uh, the potential of growth. And, and uh, when you talked about uh, control, I mean, you all know classrooms are um, a, a spaces of control, uh, at least traditionally. And, and uh, now, uh, it's becoming clear that uh, learning happens through negotiation, whether it's negotiation of meaning, of, of uh, deciding who uh, does what, when, and how. Um, um, and, and yes, we can talk about it till the com uh, cows come home, but uh, it's very interesting because we can veer off and we won't uh, to what creativity is, why, why uh, and why teachers are in classrooms and what their role is as leaders uh, in the classroom and how they position themselves as leaders, not because not not because the students are expected to obey them, but uh, it's really a leader of um, you know uh, as a result of respect. Students learn how to respect the teacher uh, and trust the teacher and collaborate and cooperate mm -hmm. with the teachers to, to because they they have the same mission, vision, and values in terms of what needs to happen when and why. Um, so, so, um, but we won't talk about creativity. I think uh, we have uh, some other questions I wanted to ask you um, and um, we will be able to perhaps to talk about it some other time. So um, my next question is, um, uh, what are some local and contextual limitations that constrain your work as a change agent in curriculum and teacher education? And how are these constraints compared to those of other locations. Um, and, and I think it's a, in, in nature, a comparative question, uh, question so that we can understand our context and so that we can learn from other places or mm -hmm. our listeners will potentially learn from your context and apply what is possible to be applied uh, knowing their constraints. Yeah, that's. I, I spend a lot of my time right now um, trying not to to get too caught up in all these constraints because there are so many. It's easy as a as an educator in in the U.S. right now, but also in particular as a teacher educator, to feel really uh, demoralized by all the constraints. So I would say, and this is a very um, to some extent, I, I recognize this is a very uh, U.S. centric set of constraints, and I'm. Um, cautiously optimistic that things are a little better elsewhere from what I understand. I would say right now, everybody, every educator I have met in the U.S., from classroom teachers up to the superintendent of schools, up to the um, to our head of the education department, recognizes that we need uh, more diverse teachers, that we need teachers who reflect the richness and cultural diversity of our students. And in the US, we've, um, we're have fast approaching uh, having more than half of our students be students of color nationwide. And we're still stuck, I, I believe, at nationwide, it's like below 20% of teachers are teachers of color. Um, and, and also, we need extremely effective, well-trained, well-prepared um, teachers who reflect that diversity. So it's not just a matter of getting bodies in rooms. Um, but, you know, we know teaching is enormously complex and that learning to do it even at a minimum level of effectiveness takes a lot of work. Um, you can't just drop somebody in a classroom and expect them to be brilliant. It's teaching is a, is a vastly undervalued 
it, I, I think it's underprofessionalized in the US and also there's just misperceptions around what the work of teaching actually entails. So everybody recognizes that, that I know of at least, um, who cares about the work. And yet it is incredibly difficult to find ways to, to fund at least a full year of high quality preparation, um, which means that our historically underrepresented folks who are interested in becoming teachers can't see their way to doing it because they cannot afford a year out of the workforce. The US does not have very many opportunities to be paid to do training. Um, and of course, teacher salaries are incredibly low on the whole. And so it's not that, you know, unlike being a doctor, a year of training is even less sustainable because they, they can see that they're not going to be able to pay back their loans on any kind of timeline that makes sense. And so I honestly think that funding is is the, the nut we need to crack in the U.S. if we can figure, if because a lot of other things could come. If we could offer our candidates a fully funded or even partially funded year of preparation, they would come. I don't doubt that. But what happens instead is that there is a lot of alternative pathways into teaching where you do not have to have a year of training because there's shortages. And so states open up all kinds of legislation that allows teachers to just start teaching right away. And people who are looking at teaching careers, especially those who don't have um, a lot of uh, assets in their family, financial assets, they can't afford not to do those, those pathways that are faster. So they take what they go often what we call an intern pathway or an alt cert pathway. They take a teaching job right away. They are underprepared for it. It overwhelms them. They weren't ready for how many things a teacher has to be able to do at once. Um, and after a year or two, they leave because it's unsustainable because they haven't had the preparation and it's a, it's a vicious cycle. And then there's then the state opens up or keeps open the loophole that allows for those alternative pathways. Um, and this happens in every state in the U.S., you know, has a slightly different ecosystem, but um, it's a wilderness of possibilities for somebody who's thinking about being a teacher. And when it doesn't push folks away entirely, often what happens is, you know, they only stay in the field for a few years. And so I spend way too much of my time, my, my heart is really with like the design and pedagogy and learning experiences for candidates once they're in a program like mine. But I spend, well, you know, the, the nighttime hours I'm awake, tossing and turning, it, it's about how do we figure out how to like change the game on funding for our folks so that we can get the people we want to train and then train them well. Um, and nobody's quite figured that out in the U.S. And we certainly don't have a, cent a particularly centralized system. So it's really a state by state dilemma to be grappling with. But I, I don't think that we can change the quality of the teachers and the teaching or the diversity of the teachers that we get at a grand scale until we figure out how we can actually organize around the idea that every teacher needs at very least one full year of supported student teaching alongside high quality learning experiences before they are a teacher of record, before they're responsible for children. And frankly, a year might not be enough, but you know, at least a year, not two weeks, not six weeks, not six months, but at least a year. Sorry, I'm, I'm on my soapbox here, but it just feels like the thing without which we can never really scale the kind of work that we wanna be doing. I think um, um, I think the linchpin um, is, is uh the misperceptions about what it is that teachers, what, what it is people uh, think that teachers do. And I think framing it as, as uh, training, seeing pe uh, teachers as trained, uh, and which makes us, forces us to think about teaching as a technical profession, uh, as a technical, um, uh, a, uh, you know, action rather than seeing a, a teacher as a professional. And I think if once we understand that teach, a teacher is not a, a technician, it's not that you identify what the problem is and you know you have a toolbox and you know what to uh, do and what tools to use to solve the problem. That's not what teaching is. I think the misperception is very uh, uh, counterproductive because as you said, it, it, it makes people go on a certain path where, when they when they understand teaching as a technical skill. I think one of the things that need to happen is address this misperception of what it is that teachers do and understand uh, teachers as a profession, uh, teaching as a profession. The teaching as a profession has a lot to do with understanding learning theories, understanding what works and what 
and what does not work and why. The why is very important. So even if uh, teacher candidates are expecting the, you know, the practical hands-on thing, you know, activities or, or lesson plans that they are um, uh, thirsty, right, for, if we in a teacher education program I, I succeed in working with teacher candidates in understanding that a teaching um, that teaching is a profession, the more you understand the, how things work, the better you will be able to address problems. Teaching is never an easy job uh, with, as I said, with teenagers uh, and, and elementary school as well. Mm -hmm. I actually would, yeah, I would, I would just respond to that. I think there's even a connection between what you're saying um, and that notion that we need schools to be different than what they already are, right? Because I think if you think about teaching as relaying content to a bunch of, you know, empty vessels, um, and what the teacher does is basically help the kids understand what's in the textbook, sure, they don't need deep sustained high quality training. I mean, arguably even that is, is harder than folks might think, but, um, but if we actually take seriously, like you're saying, the idea that being learner centered means being a, a scholar of your students thinking and meeting 30, you know, at a, in a given moment, meeting 30 different sets of needs and 30 different sets of pre-existing beliefs and schemas and identities and cultures and responding in the moment to all those things. And, you know, like facilitating social learning and all the stuff we were describing before, that's to your point that's when all of a sudden the implications for what it looks like to be ready to do that at even a minimum novice level is is enormous right no no we can't drop somebody in there at age 23 with a college degree and expect them to do that no matter how brilliant they are um and even a year might not be enough like i look to a place like finland where you know you have at least two years of supported learning and coursework before you even are partially responsible for a class on your own. I mean, that that just feels like such a more honest acknowledgement of how much teachers need to know and how much they need to be able to do and how much practice it takes to be able to do it um, even reasonably well without harm to your students. Um, and you are alluding to another concept here, um, synchronization. Um, the, uh, Canada is also one of the countries that introduced a two-year program in, in teacher education. Um, and I, I think that was, uh, th there was lots of resentment in the beginning. Um, and, you know, going back to, the, to your point of this, there is a misperception about what it is that the teacher does in the classroom. Uh, but and and, and uh, teacher education programs are still growing and developing in terms of okay, what is it that teacher educate uh, um, candidates need in terms of better understanding what what you know the ever changing students' needs are. Um, so going back to the idea of synchronization, I think we uh, you know and and for the sake of being optimistic. Uh, optimists here, or one optimist, and I know you are too. Uh, <laughs> that's why you're here. Um, I think uh, the idea of learning from others is important. So Finland is uh, is uh, one uh, place we can learn from. Um, Canada is another place, mm -hmm. and I'm not claiming that Canada has all the answers, but I think the uh, realization that it needs to be a two a, mm -hmm. at least a two year program with lots of support, as you said, lots of support. Yeah. Change does not happen with exams and tests and and um, uh, certification uh, tests. It happens with an ongoing support. Yeah. Through time practice teacher yeah. education uh, um, uh, uh, professional development and so on and so forth um so so perhaps we can talk about the other side of the coin here and talk about the uh local and contextual possibilities in your context that enable your work as a change agent in curriculum and teacher education and how are these compared to other locations mm, yeah that's a good one i like going from pessimism to op optimism that's the right direction. Um, Jal and I in our book talk about uh, how we feel like we wrote a, an optimistic book about a pessimistic topic. Um, yeah, so well, first of all, my program, the San Diego Teacher Residency, um, what is we are hosted by uh, an alternative graduate school, um, High Tech High Graduate School of Education, which alternative not in this that we have the same credentialing and accreditation that others do, but 
We are small and nimble, and most importantly, we were built um, originally on top of a set of schools that were at the high tech high schools, which had a vision for teaching and learning, which I think matches some of what I said, project-based, non-tracked, uh, equity-focused um, schools that were really seeking to take a diverse set of students and engage them in like deep, authentic, collaborative work together. And our graduate school, I think the greatest asset we have is the fact that those 16 schools, which are all around San Diego County, um, are still the uh, the primary sites for preparation for my for my graduate students who are training to be teachers. And so um, in teacher education, we also we often talk about the two worlds problem where there's the world of the higher ed um, and the scholars uh, who, you know, support teacher candidates and learning about the work of teaching, um, which at worst is very, very, very so theoretical that candidates can't make a connection to um, practice, but at best can actually be very richly grounded in, in current theory and so forth. Um, and then, but then also there's the schools that they do their clinical practice in, which if you're not careful, those things are extremely different from each other. And for a novice, it's, it's too much dissonance. You, you can't make sense of practices looking and sounding one way in this context and then looking and sounding a different way in this context. That's not, that it's not something a novice teacher can really make sense of very well. And often what happens of course, is that they end up waving away all the contributions that the graduate school might offer because they say, well, those people can talk a big talk, but what really works is what I see in my classroom. And that's what I'm gonna do. Cause I've seen it can, it can you know, get me where I'm trying to go. So because we have this distinctive relationship of a graduate school that shares a vision of teaching and learning and a set of values with a set of schools, um, I think we are somewhat successfully trying to build on that as our biggest asset, which is that there's real coherence um, and ideally kind of like almost a kind of complementary uh, relationship between the four days a week my folks spend in the classroom practicing and learning and gradually taking over some of the, the pedagogical work and the one and a half days they spend with us at the graduate school. We try to make those as tightly connected as possible and we try to really minimize the, the dissonance they experience so that they can really talk about this thing on Thursday and then go back to their classroom on Friday and, and try it and see it and talk with their mentors about it and they're having the same conversation that they were having in grad school. Um, the dilemma there is that number one higher ed in the US rarely has deep relationships with K-12 schools. It's very unusual to find a situation like the one I'm in. And number two, um, too often there are not enough schools which as whole institutions have committed to a particularly rich vision of teaching and learning. You just happen to have teachers in various pockets who are doing more powerful work, but it's not usually a school level um, set of values, at least here in the U.S. So that, so it's it's our asset. It's our asset, but also our puzzle is how do we begin to identify and work with other schools beyond this particular network that share those values, where we can cultivate them, and where we can minimize that dissonance. Because you know, it's it's not a scalable model where you have you know they, there aren't many other grad schools that have that kind of um, that kind of asset to to draw on. So I I'm glad we have it, but I, it also puzzles me to think about how we can make that something that is more common across the US, not just in our little tiny kind of boutique institution. And this, this dissonance uh, you talk about uh, is experienced here too. Uh, I, you know, when teachers, uh, teacher, teacher candidates come to class and say, this is too theoretical. Yep. I just uh, got, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, a note uh, saying that they want more, uh, teacher candidates want more of, practice oriented uh, uh, training rather than a theoretical discussions about what can be. They want to know what they should do rather than what they can do. And so that, that dissonance is, is um, a, a, a good puzzle. Uh, I, I'm not sure if there is an answer to it or there's, there is one solution, but I think it's a, it's a good puzzle to, uh, to uh, think about. Um, that leads uh, me to um, uh, my last question. Uh, in the face of the crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic, what do you think might be some new directions for research and practice in curriculum for teacher education programs? That's a big one. <laughs> um, well, I'll be an optimist for a moment. I think one thing that came out of the pandemic, uh, as I observed it play out here in California, 
um, which I'm hopeful will stick and will impact the whole ecosystem, including teacher preparation, is this sort of insistence that psychological safety, social emotional learning uh, and belongingness are like absolutely have to come first. Um, I think when the pandemic first started and everything ground to a halt and went online, every teacher I, I knew, regardless of how focused they were on this prior, was very clear, I need my kids, I, I need to help nurture the relationships that we have before we do any kind of contact. Like that always comes first. And um, and we need to address trauma and we need to make sure we trust each other and we need to make sure kids trust each other and we need to have a learning community where folks feel safe. Um, and that became like a very sharp, was sort of in sharp relief for a little while. Um, and I would like to believe that even with the return to in-person schooling and even with the kind of um, the the uptick in assessments again and, and and kind of like normative practices of schooling that all came right back online the moment that schools came back in person that that hasn't fallen away entirely that that both preparation programs and in-service teachers in schools have a sharper clearer sense um, of what we all are already know right which is that relationships have to be the foundation for learning and the moment that the relationships erode is the moment that the learning is going to be lim sharply limited um and, it, you know, and, and moreover, relationships are not just a means to an end, right? Like they are worthy unto themselves, helping kids respect and understand and empathize with and um, connect with others is one of the most important things we can do in our schools. So that is something I think in our program has always been a value. And, and the pandemic has reinforced that no matter how pulled we feel like, oh, my gosh, we're not there's just all these topics in, you know, math pedagogy that we're not getting to. And we need, you know, it's very tempting to constantly replace that work with other stuff that we feel we need to put in there. Cause you know, there's a zero something where we only have so much time with them. We only have so many courses we can offer to them in a year. Um, and I think the pandemic has helped us as I hope it has helped schools say like, no, we've got to find another way to do that other stuff because the, the self-work and the community work, like we cannot, compromise that foundation that is the most important thing we we can do here um so that's i don't know i didn't see a ton of like pedagogical innovations coming out of the pandemic the way that some people hoped i i hoped well i didn't see it but i did see that kind of sharpening of commitment around community and and sel and um and trust i i agree with you i think uh when you you use the word ecosystem i think you touched upon uh you know a, a helpful framework of how i uh, the uh this reality excuse me for covid of covid where everything was shut down uh, forced us to reimagine uh, teaching and learning as as being aware or perhaps surfacing the notion of ecosystems uh, and mm -hmm. seeing students as rather than silos, um, a, you know, uh, full-blown human being that have different experiences and different contexts to, um, th that need to be uh, taken into consideration when we work with them. And yes, I agree with you. It is a sense of belonging and relationship that this uh, uh, pandemic, uh, that this crisis um, forced us to think about. Um, <clears throat> um, so th this is the conclusion of our interview. I think we can talk about many other things that uh, have emerged uh, in our conversation, but we can uh, do it uh, another time. Uh, another time. Part, part two. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fine, for um, um, making the time to meet with me. And um, I hope uh, we will continue the conversation some other time. Yeah, me as well. Thank you for having me. This has been, this has been great. It's a great conversation.